I have recently written a book called The Fire of Freedom about a young fugitive slave, renegade abolitionist, and union spy who rose out of slavery to become one of the most significant and stirring black leaders in Civil War America. His name was Abraham H. Galloway. Born into slavery in Smithville, North Carolina in 1837, he escaped to Canada when he was only 20 years old. Smithville is now Southport. It's uh, the mouth of the Cape Fear River below Wilmington. Four years later, he returned south as a Union spy in the first days of the war. He infiltrated deep behind enemy lines, spying against the Confederacy and organizing slave resistance all the way from North Carolina to the Mississippi River. Later in the war, he became a cherished leader of the South's freed people, played a, played a decisive role in organizing some of the first Union regiments of ex-slaves to fight in the war, and led his people toward an independent political course committed to destroying the Confederacy, but always wary of the Union. He seemed to be everywhere. One moment he was conspiring to launch, this is a quote, a second John Brown attack against the South, this time from a base in Haiti. The next he was, and this is also a quote, inciting insurrection in Virginia slave communities. The next he was deep behind enemy lines in Mississippi. The next he was rescuing his mother from slavery in Wilmington, North Carolina, giving ground to no man, black or white, rebel or Yankee. He burned with an incandescent passion against slavery and injustice in a way that served as a beacon to the lowly across America. I would like to talk briefly about Galloway, his encounter with President Lincoln, and the ways in which African American communities in the Civil War South celebrated challenged and reinterpreted the very meaning of the Emancipation Proclamation. I would like to do so by telling two stories from Galloway's life. The first concerns the delegation of black Southerners that he led to the White House in the spring of 1864. That historic meeting illustrates powerfully the proclamation's importance within the black South, but also the, the degree to which Galloway and his comrades considered it merely a first, fragile, uncertain, and halfway step in the road to freedom and citizenship. Lincoln had conferred with free black leaders from the North earlier in the Civil War, but this marked his first formal encounter with African American leaders from the South. On 29 April 1864, the war's third year. Galloway led a delegation to the White House that also included five of the political activists to whom he was closest in eastern North Carolina. Black Southerners all, four of them ex-slaves, the delegation consisted of a brick mason, which was at Galloway, he was, as a slave, he was a brick mason, two other building tradesmen, a farmer, a baker, and a preacher, the Reverend Isaac K. Felton. They were not the White House's typical guest. Galloway and his colleagues presented the president with a petition that touched briefly on their gratitude for the Emancipation Proclamation, but concentrated on their demands for suffrage and political rights. In a gesture that might have seemed brassy, if not downright impudent, they quoted the Declaration of Independence to Lincoln, reminding him that he was president of a country that proclaimed, these are their words, quoting other words, all men are created free and equal. And they argued respectfully, but forcefully, that the Union owed a debt to black Americans for the sacrifice made by the more than 100,000 of their number serving in the Federal Army and Navy. Above all else, 
the black leaders sought to convey to the president their fierce commitment to obtaining voting rights. In their eyes, all other political aspirations rested on the right to cast their own ballots. Without voting rights, Galloway told Lincoln, whatever had been given them could be taken away, including emancipation. They beseeched Lincoln in their petition's words to finish the noble work you have begun and grant unto your petitioners the greatest of privileges when the state is reconstructed to exercise the right of suffrage, which will greatly extend our sphere of usefulness, redound to your honor, and cause posterity to the latest generation to acknowledge their deep sense of gratitude. Lincoln assured them, in their words, of his sympathy and earnest cooperation, but the president made no commitment to African American voting rights. He told them that he sympathized with their yearning for the full rights of American citizenship, but he still insisted that individual states should have the prerogative to, to determine the rights of their citizens, black and white, after a union victory. <laughs> 